Salute the fisk. It's like, I don't like that shit either. <laughs> Enjoy. That's just gonna make him more mad. Yeah. Tastes like ass. <laughs> that smells like shit. Fish jello. I'd rather sit your peek on my face again. <laughs> you think this is a game, kid? I'm a goddamn barn elf. Now, I, I, I think the. Well, that one has and never this, been more angry. This seems a bit far fetched right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Booze, Bullshit, and B Movies. We're happy to have you with us again as we dive to the depths of the streaming services to find entertainment in unlikely places. I'm Brandon, and I am joined, as always, by my buddy Steve. Hey, everybody. And this week, we are going to stay in Norway with a little more holiday cheer with a movie called There's Something in the Barn. Now, before we get to that, Steve, I do have one little bit of information for you. I was doing some research on the analytics of our podcast. Yes. And I have found that we are up to 11 Spotify followers. Watch out, world. We're coming at you. Well, the interesting thing to me about that was that we don't have that many members in our families. Well, that's true. So we must have uh, acquired a couple followers who we are not related to. But I know for a fact, I talked to my sister today and she has not yet listened. So, So Danielle, get on the stick. And it is possible, even at this point, that there might be someone following us that we've never met. That's true. Wouldn't that be crazy? That would be bizarro. And if you are out there, if you are this person who has never met Steve or me and is following us on Spotify, send us a tweet or something and we'll acknowledge you as our first... Non-family member fan. (laughs) Non-family member fan. Yeah. Not saying that all of our family members are fans, but they have listened. So now, Steve... There's something in the barn. Yep, there's something in a barn. So we decided let's make this an all Nordic December after our fun with dead snow and our what our plan for our Christmas movie, which we won't quite let off the bag yet. But uh, there's something in the barn, and we thought, well, you know, we still have some Akavit left over, so let's uh, let's stick in the general region. I did find that interesting, also, that after last week's lukewarm reviews of the Aquavit, you're back for more. Well, you know, it, you, you know, we gotta gotta give it a shot. So, I'm all about second chances, except for wrong cops. It doesn't get a second chance. Okay, so there's something in the barn. This is only been out for like a month. Released November 10th of 23. So this is a brand new first run movie. Here we go, cutting edge. We are uh, we are on top of it. Now it was it did have a sneak run uh, a couple of months prior in a film festival, but we're not going to count that. Uh, running time is an hour and forty minutes, so uh, kind of a little bit out of our this hour is... out of our ninety minute limit. But yeah, you know, what's ten minutes between friends? This is the same production company that did the Dead Snow sequel, so it sounded fun. Yes. No, I couldn't find any budgetary numbers on it. I did find that so far it has made over a half a million dollars. So that's pretty good. They listed the genre of this one as fantasy, horror, comedy. So that's uh, kind of an interesting meld. And that, that also piqued our interest. Director on this is Magnus Martins. Um, he's he's mostly known for just a ton of TV credits. Biggest ones. He did an episode of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Did an episode of uh, Luke Cage. And then he did uh, five episodes on a couple of the various Walking Dead spinoffs. So, you know, this this guy's right there in the horror genre and the uh, kind of supernatural superhero genre. So so that's that should be pretty fun. And I did notice he had a movie called SAS Red Notice uh, that looked kind of interesting. Kind of a um, special forces, something's gone wrong, and they've got to, you know, off everybody. So that looked kind of interesting. Probably not a B-movie, but something interesting to check out. Writers listed were Alexander Kirkwood Brown. I think he did most of it. And then Josh Epstein, who was listed as a as a consultant. Alexander is also working on a project called Drog, which 
I think would be right up Brandon's alley. There. Yeah, it sounds like it. So that was pretty cool. There's something in the barn stars Martin Starr as Bill Nordheim. Um, and you may have seen him in uh, Tulsa King on, um, like, I, I believe that's on Paramount Plus. Uh, he's the pot shop owner there in Tulsa that S- S- Sly Stallone is doing some uh, business with. Uh, he also is has voiceover credits in some of the recent Beavis and Butthead, their movie and uh, the uh, revitalization of the of the cartoon uh, listed as quote unquote man. And you, uh, may as a father of a younger person, and my young youngest son likes it as well. The recent Spider-Man movies, um, the Spider-Man Coming Home, and uh, one of the other ones I forgot to write down which version it was. They all kind of run together after a while. He, uh, Martin Starr, is Mr. Harrison, the the uh, school teacher in uh, in those uh, couple of franchises there. He was in Freaks and Geeks in Silicon Valley. So you know this is a legit star. Yeah, it sounds um, like it. And then we have. Amarita Akakaria as Carol Nordheim. She will, will is in Dead Snow 2 and is in 13 episodes of Game of Thrones. I'm beginning to think this movie might be too good for us. It, it might. We'll, we'll see. It was hard to tell what actually she was playing in Game of Thrones, but I believe she was one of like the Khaleesi's handmaidens there. In the, she was just in the first uh, first season or so. First season, maybe first episode or so of the second season. So, okay. so that tells me she was one of the uh, Khaleesi handmaidens. Then we get to probably our biggest star... And uh, Kieran Shaha, he plays the main elf. This dude has been acting since I was a kid, and damn near since before you were born. He uh, plays the main elf. He was in both of the Hobbit films. He was in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He was in Andor, Solo, Rise of Skywalker, The Last Jedi, Force Awakens, Rogue One, and Return of the Jedi as an Ewok. I wonder if that's why the movie poster for this looked like it was out of the Star Wars universe. It that quite possibly could be an homage to that. Then next, then we get to the polar opposite, uh, Towns Booner, who plays Lucas Nordheim. This is his first major role. Pretty much the first role that was listed on for him on, on IMDb. Uh, I'm sure he's done some, some commercial work or something like that, but this is his first major acting role. Um, and he finds his way into our show. He finds he's, his way into our show. He's hit the big time. That's true. Uh, then we got Zoe Winther Hansen. She plays Nora Nordheim, and she's been in a couple things, but then we got Giuseppe Black, or Jep, uh, Beck Lorison as Raymond. So, uh, so, so Zepp was in, uh, Dead Snow. He was Erland, so he was one of the guys that got killed inside the cabin. Oh, okay, he wasn't the guy who... No, he was not your favorite (laughs) character of the, of that particular film. Uh... Who got bit in the lower abdominal area? That's correct. Then we get, he's also in, uh, Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, which, as we remember from last week, a lot of our Dead Snow folks are in that. This film had a couple of taglines listed for it. Uh, one was, none of them are as, are as memorable as Eins Fi Die or gobble, some, gobble, some of the other fire. ones. <laughs> yes. So, this Christmas, you must respect your elf. Traditions die hard. And nothing bad ever happens in Norway. So, I, I think that last one's kind of my favorite. So, a few fun facts about this one. Um, it was filmed mainly in... Uh, Tretton, Norway, which is located down in the southern, kind of southeastern portion of Norway near the Swedish border. Fun thing about Tretton, it's the location of the largest train disaster in Norwegian history. When two passenger trains collided head-on February 22nd, 1975. Hmm. But only 27 deaths, so as far as largest disasters of mass transit, it could have been worse. Could have been worse, so... Uh, they also had a big bridge collapse there, so Trenton's not really on the map for the right reasons, I don't think. <laughs> um, then uh, our our star as the main elf, uh, Kieran Shaw, he's in the in the Guinness Book of World Records. He he's the holder as the shortest working stuntman since October of 2003. He's held that title. He is a mighty four foot two inches, or 1.27 meters for our European friends. Martin Starr has a cousin who lives in Norway, so he was able to... That's how us. he got hooked up with the Norwegian cast? Um, I, I think so. I, I think they knew him from his other, other body of work in America, but he did dig being able to uh, hang out with his cousin and you know, crash at his place for a while and stuff like that. So 
Uh, they shot this over about a seven week period. I was listening to a um, to an interview with the uh, the directors and writers who said that when they were scouting locations the year before, the the area that they had selected the film and had the cabin just was it had so much snow that it was almost impossible. You couldn't couldn't get around. Well. A year later, they get in there. Everyone's in town, ready to go. Zero snow, hmm. which is makes it a little difficult to uh, film your Christmas movie. So, so they had to truck in snow to make it make it go. So they were very, very. Um, they they wanted to use a lot of practical effects and then use the CGI to kind of just accentuate the practical effects. So so they they worked hard to make that natural snow either look fresh or trodden or whatnot, and they worked their tail off. So so that was kind of cool. And then the uh, the idea of a barn elf is uh, kind of steeped in Scandinavian tradition. So the barn elf, also known as the Fe Ors Nissen, is a creature from Scandinavian folklore often described as a short man no bigger than a horse's head, wearing gray clothes, knickerbockers, and a red hat, similar to what Norwegian farmers would wear. As the name suggests, he lives in the barn. Of course, he was also also shy, so shy that he was hardly ever seen. But he was a good little helper on the farm, as long as the farmers treated him well, especially at Christmas. He would expect to get a large bowl of porridge and some home-brewed beer, in return for looking after the livestock. Uh, often farmers would also leave the leftovers from Christmas dinner on the table. Uh, he was also known as uh, Nissi, could help himself. Uh, but if farmers failed to keep him fed and happy, the Nissi would do mischief or harm to both animals and people. So, And I feel like that's what's going to happen in this movie. I think there's a little bit of foreshadowing there, yes. Um, now on to our reviews. Germain Lussier from Gizmondo said... What would National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation look like if Clark and his family had to fight a bunch of killer elves? You can get a very, very close approximation in the new movie, There's Something in the Barn. Stars Martin Short, Martin Starr as I keep wanting to say Martin Short. Martin Starr as a happy-go-lucky father who moves his family to Norway, only to find out that an actual elf lives in their barn. The elf is cool with the family being there until they start breaking the rules. Then all hell breaks loose. And then uh, Brian uh, Wiener from the Daily Mail said, If you don't mind your Christmas spirit curdled by murder and mayhem, there's plenty here to put you in a festive mood. So I think that makes it up your alley there, Brendan. I think so too. For the first few minutes, I thought it was a kid's film, which gives you an inkling into the general approach. Right up until I heard a teenager dropping the F-bomb. That's from uh, Kath Clark of The Guardian. So lots of um, Euro reviewers on this one. Uh, it's a movie with an identity crisis that is too violent for its seemingly intended audience and too childish for the older crowd that might be drawn in to the more chaotic antics on the back half of the movie. Too That's, violent and too childish? No, yeah, I think it's, on, from, from what I've read, it's a tale of two movies. Like It's kind of a, a split in half between some storytelling and then action, action, action. So well, this Trace Thurman here says too violent and too childish as though that's an insult. I know. That's what but, are you going to do? I don't know where Bloody Disgusting is from, but uh, he doesn't have our sensibilities. Fans of Violent Night, Rare Exports, and Krampus are going to lose their minds over There's Something in the Barn. This horror comedy offers gore and laughter in equal measure, says Mike. Mike McGranahan from Isle Seat. I think that pretty much sums it up. Well, now that we've got the preliminaries out of the way, why don't we head over to the bar and grab ourselves a drink? Sounds good. It's time for the Cocktail of the Week. Alright Steve, so like I said, I'm kind of surprised that we're back here for another round of Aquavit, but this is where we find ourselves. We are drinking the Nordic Sidecar. Classic Sidecar, just swapping out the uh, I think it's gin in there with the aqu Aquavit. We've got enough to make a couple of cocktails here left in our bottle, so we are going to kill this bad boy off. So we'll start with two ounces of the Aquavit. There's one. Pouring carefully. Two. And then we do a uh, an ounce of an orange liqueur. As we said, we try not to give brand names unless it's absolutely necessary, or they choose to give us some money to sponsor. Uh, so it's an ounce of the orange liqueur, and then an ounce of lemon juice. 
That's a pretty simple recipe there. Yeah. A couple ounces of aquavit, one ounce of orange liqueur, and one ounce of lemon juice. Easy peasy. Put it in a shaking tin, some ice. Shake this bad boy for, that's probably enough for broadcasting purposes there. And, and then we're, we're going to strain it into a chilled martini glass. Ooh, a chilled martini glass. Yeah, we're nothing but fancy around here. You can choose a garnish with a uh, lemon wedge if you like. And that is the Norwegian sidecar. Looks good. All right, so we've got our two martinis here. Let's give them a try. I prefer this to last week's drink. Yeah, not nearly as sweet. You still get the caraway seed, mm -hmm. but not overpowering. No, I like this. Yeah. The, 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 the little bit of lemon juice, the orange, it plays better. I agree. Without overpowering the aquavit, which actually in this drink isn't bad at all. No, not at all. And the interesting thing about this aquavit I learned while I was buying this bottle is that this particular brand's shtick is that it's been distilled for 200 years. And at some point, they shipped it to the East Indies okay. a couple hundred years ago on accident. And it was returned, undrank, off the ship. And then they decided after getting it back that that somehow improved the flavor. So now this Aquavit is still distilled in Norway, put on a ship, and sailed around the earth so that it crosses the equator twice. Hmm. And that is the gimmick that creates the unique flavor of this brand of Aquavit. So it's true what they say, it is about the motion of the ocean. <laughs> Pretty big ship too though, I bet. Yeah, probably. All right, we've got our delicious martinis here. Let's watch a movie that is both too childish and too violent for some fancy pants person at The Guardian. This is the part where we watch the movie. All right, Steve. Well, we just finished watching There's Something in the Barn. So we start off with an old man lives in his house. He and the barn elf are fighting. And he inadvertently lights himself on fire while trying to destroy the barn elf's home. Then we end up with his descendants or his... his what was he? His nephew? His nephew, yeah. They inherit the house and they decide to drop everything leave California, and move to Norway yep. to open so, an Airbnb. Dad, stepmother, teenage daughter, teenage son. And upon arrival, the young son finds out that there is a barn elf living there, meets a man in town who gives him the mythology behind the barn elf. Very much like in Dead Snow, where the old man told him, you did not research your mythology before you came up on your hike. This time, he gave it to him without the snark. So the rest of the family is acting like your typical group of Americans. They're loud. They're trying to make friends with the locals who don't want to be friends with them. They set up their Christmas decorations for the holiday. All of these things make the barn elf mad. Right. The son who has heard the story behind the barn elf and has seen the barn elf tries to get them to stop doing what they're doing, but they don't believe him. They won't listen. Right, because Tor in the, in the, um, in the uh, town there... Gave him the three rules, which were, don't change anything, don't have any bright lights, don't make a lot of noise, which the family's doing all of those. So they are trying to become, trying to ingrain themselves with the town. So what do they decide to do? Let's throw a party in the barn with lots of lights and loud music and drinking and... Exactly the opposite of what the barn elf wants. Correct. And mind you, Tour has a museum for the Barn Elf, but doesn't believe that they actually exist. And in the interim, there were a couple little scenes where the Barn Elf was getting irritated with the family, tried to drop a barrel on their head, uh, went in the house and destroyed some dishes. Gave some subtle hints to get the fuck out. And they didn't listen. So then... The, we're, the we're, daughter may, was making friends with one of the local teenagers, and they decided to drink too much. She barfed on the... Uh, so the, the daughter the got drunk and puked on the barn elf, and that set him off for the last time. So he summons the horde of barn elves. Well, remember, they were kind of getting the better of him. They tried to, The family tried to leave in the car. They turned the lights on. They managed to get the car to move a little bit, knocked the elf down... Hmm? 
and he's like, oh shit, they may be getting the better of me. So he screams so really loud, and then, then yeah, that's right. Then and he then summoned like ten other barn elves show up, and mayhem ensues. Yeah. So from there, there are fights in the house. Barn elves are getting beat with baseball bats, stabbed with broken sticks. Uh, they chase. There's a sled chase where the barn elves are chucking circular saw blades at Bill and Lucas. Um, they call the police. Oh yeah. The police yeah. lady shows up. On her snowmobile, and one of the barn elves jumps on the snowmobile and is doing donuts in the driveway in the snowmobile, and eventually they run down the police officer and then grind her up under the treads of the snowmobile. Take her hats off, bye-bye to live, the police officer. Which is another thing that happened in Dead Snow. There was a, there was no, a scene in true. Dead Snow where they killed the zombie with the snowmobile. That is a fact. So, so then they split up. The father and the son head to town to get this. Well, they're trying to get, not to town, they're trying to go to Tor's house. That's right. They, they go and they locate the barn elf expert to find out how to make amends or create a peace with the barn elf. Or call the other police station, which is three hours away, because all their phones were dead. They return to the house to find that the mother and the daughter had been abducted by the barn elves. And they, so they, they find a trap door in the barn. Which leads to a subterranean passageway that is quite... Elaborate. Elaborate, yes, yes. And goes out to the village of the Barn Elves, which that kind of goes against the idea of the Barn Elf in general, that... They live in the barn. They live in a barn. But we're not. We're going to suspend some disbelief here. Yeah, we should suspend some disbelief in the movie about the Barn Elves. <laughs> right. So there, there are... The, uh, the women are tied together on a pole... A la Salem Witch Trials or something. Or our heroes in Return of the Jedi by the Ewoks. Oh, that's right. As the uh, the horde of Barn Elves have been being meaner and meaner and getting closer to doing real great harm to our uh, stars here, the, the main elf is starting to feel some sympathy for his buddy. He's had a bit of a change of heart. He has. Luke, he remembers Lucas had given him cookies and was trying to be a friend. And then the tour guy also was saying something to the effect of, you know, that people and elves lived in peace for hundreds of years. And helped but, each other out. But then those traditions fell away over the last however many years, and now they've come to this situation where they cannot make amends. And he's going to try to negotiate a peace between the elves and the humans. That's right. And he, he was very adamant that in order to make that... To negotiate, you have to understand both sides and, and be in the middle and approach it from that way. So. He was going to try to get his Nobel Peace Prize. Correct. Instead, he got a bullet from a Glock. But in the shoulder, in he the survived. Shoulder. It was a flesh wound. He, everything was fine. Yes. Then main main elf helps them out, releases the family from the from the bonds of the fire before the horde of elves can do whatever damage they were going to do. They escape back to the house. They're still battling in the barn of the existing elves that are trying to kill them. Ma, stepmom, and daughter have the men leave, chuck a paper airplane that they light on fire down to the main floor of the barn. Catches some gasoline and some fertilizer. Barn blows up. All the bad elves are dead. Our friendly elf is now homeless. And Tor returns with some friendly elves. Friendly-ish. Who want peace. At least didn't kill him. But then the barn, the original barn elf does not have a home. So they come to the resolution that he will move in to Tor's barn elf themed museum. And live his days there. Because as Tor said, no one ever visits anyway. And they'll all live in peace. And that is the end. With the, sax, sax solo for the, they see the northern lights, everything's happy, and they go off their merry way. The four family members all survive. The original barn elf survives. Tor survives. The police officer didn't make it. Uh, A drunk townsman didn't make it. Yeah, that was Raymond. That was our buddy from Dead Snow. He died in that one, too. A handful of barn elves are killed in the various melees. Yeah, there were some comedy for that so with that what'd you think of this movie 
I think this movie was about three deleted fucks away from being a Hallmark movie. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, I'm going to give it a... It was entertaining. It was a little groany. And, you know, you expect that out of a B movie. It didn't take itself too seriously, which was good. It was... There were some funny spots. There were some decent blood and guts. Nothing like Dead Snow. But it was... You know, it was kind of funny when the police... You, you put a good point. It was, she had kind of a, like a Fargo vibe to her. She was cool. I liked her. But she did die in a, in a pretty horrific and splattery way. So, so that was a plus on the horror side for that. I would agree. This was not a horror movie. It was a comedy. Trying to be a feel-good family film, it was not, didn't quite know what it wanted to be. So I kind of agree with that one. Um, the one review that we're like, well, it's not quite nice enough to be a family film, but it's not scary enough to be a horror film. What is it? I'm going to give it a medium, middle shelf. Yeah, I think I agree with that. It was basically, like, it was a well-produced movie. You know, the acting was was good. Decent. Set designs were good. Uh, you know, it, it was a well-produced movie. Yeah. It just wasn't particularly horror-y. It was, like, there were a couple scenes where a character was skewered with a stick or something, but it wasn't over the top that way. Not uh, talking gallons of blood here. It wasn't... It, the actors did a good job. It was a it was a fine movie. And I, I want to give props to Magnus and Alexander, the director and writer, where they had the guts to use actual little people as the elves, not trying to CGI it and stuff. And they... they, they I saw an interview, watched an interview with them, and the idea of whether they could do it or not, really, they 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 thought about it, thought about it, thought about it, and you know, with in today's cancel culture, that's a fine line you're you're walking. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they wanted to you know do honor to these actors that are out there, you know, doing their craft, give them the respect, and give them a you know a vehicle. It's like it would be more of a slap in the face to use CGI when you could have hired all these actors. Sure. So that was that was cool. It was a fine movie. Yeah. It, it, it was, like you said, kind of hallmarky Christmas with some violence involved that wasn't too gruesome. So it's the sort of movie that, I mean, you could sit down and watch this horror movie with a 10-year-old. Well, and, and one review that I read said that this was kind of like a, a horror movie starter kit. So That makes sense. If and, and the, the, the writer and director did say, like, when they were filming and writing and, and dreaming of this, they are like, you've got to think like a 12 or 13-year-old kid in how your, your thought process goes on this. And so you want it to be a little bit scary, but not too scary that it scares them away. Yeah, for sure. And that was definitely the line they, that they were walking. A couple of jump scares, a couple of, like I said, some, some goriness, but not too bad. Yeah. But, generally, so, so yeah. but generally just kind of a goofy little family movie with some... Blood splatter. Right. It was a family-friendly horror movie. Minus some colorful language. So, yeah. Uh, medium shelf. It was. It certainly wasn't a bad movie, but it, was, it wasn't a top shelf sort of a make me laugh for an hour. Agreed. With that, what are we doing next week, Brandon? It's our Christmas spectacular. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think you've been suggesting for a couple weeks now that we get to a movie called Rare Exports, and that will... Also go nicely with our, you know, Norwegian theme we've had going on for the holiday season. December in Scandinavia. So we will be watching Rare Exports next week. So um, if you want to catch There's Something in the Barn, since it is essentially a first-run movie, you've got to, the only available source is Prime. HD version is five ninety nine. We came close to popping them over uh, 565299 dollars right now. They're almost over that three hundred dollar mark. So, so they're and it, close. It, and it was a, a perfectly good movie. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's and and you could especially if you have teenagers sit down and watch it as a family. It, it it is kind of a fun one. Well, I guess that will wrap it up for tonight's episode. We appreciate you guys all joining us. Especially if you're that one random person that we've never met before. Who Correct. We don't know. We need somebody on the West Coast to listen. We do. We, 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 we do need one person to tune in somewhere from either California, Oregon, Washington State, or Hawaii because our podcast is just that close to being able to claim coast-to-coast -coast coverage. Yep. We'd even take B.C. or Alaska. Yeah. We're not anti-Canadian. Nope. We'll take anybody. 
So we'll look forward to talking to you all again next week. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm Steve. I'm Brandon. Until next time, stay fresh, cheese balls. <laughs>